I'm Rick Bradley and I'm the Operations Manager for Mind and Body. I'm Carl Robinson and I'm the Senior Supervising Clinician. I'm Tom DeBono, I'm the Family Worker for the Kent Mind and Body team. And I'm Sophie Beer, a Team Leader for Mind and Body. Um, okay, so the first one we've got is if we stop a young person self-harming uh, using one method, they'll move on to another. Um, so I think from the discussions that we've had in general, what we find is that um, the reasons why somebody might self-harm, it, it's really important just to look at their specific motivations. Um, and it may be that if they're wanting to, um, if they're wanting to try and get a, a feeling of control, then they could potentially look at a different method or a different distraction or a, um, a, another exercise that would be less risky. It doesn't necessarily mean that they would move on to you know, maybe from cutting to, um, to a different type of, of self-harm. So probably the main thing for us to, um, to take away from today is that it's really important to look at the motivations behind what they're doing and, and to be really clear in speaking with the young person about why they're um, making those behaviours, making those choices with a view to putting support in place that will be less risky further down the line. Um, no decisions about me without me should this always apply in cases of self-harm. Um, I think self-harm is really a behaviour that young people do when they feel they don't control much in their lives but one thing they can control is their body and what they do to their body. So I think if you were to take decisions about them around their self-harm without notifying them, mm. it would really feel like they were out of control of that situation and that decisions were being made for them. So I think in all, as, as much as you can, you should like, really consult with young people. And I think they'll be the experts about what will work for them, what's in their best interests. I think it's essential to, to get the young people on board in order to um, for them to actually commit to it and, and, and you're far more likely to get them a positive response by involving them within that whole process. Mm. Yeah, and give them a sense of ownership over their action plans and what works for them. The more severe the injury, the more distressed the young person is. Um, I think in our discussion we, we recognise that every um, individual situation should be looked at on its own merit and, and actually it's about recognising the, 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 again the method, the, the reason behind the, the motivation of that and, and what the young person is, is trying to achieve from self-harming and actually it's about recognising that rather than um, necessarily looking at the severity of the particular injury. And we also spoke about um, one individual young person could be um, at one time possibly going um, self-harming and um, later on down their journey may no longer be self-harming but they may still be under a great deal of distress so it's about not dismissing that or making assumptions about it as well. Um, if a young person is self-harming, our aim is to work towards a time when they're no longer harming themselves. Um, and I think the um, important thing around this is to work with the young person for them to set their own goals, um, what they want to achieve and to help them really um, in supporting them to hopefully um, reduce the harm, um, reduce any risks, um, but predominantly it's about them setting their goals and us. Um, supporting them to do so. Mm. I think one of the other things that came up on that was about um, making sure that you're not going to force them mm. towards something they don't want to do but to certainly look at um, motivations and possible benefits of changing behaviours if they might be problematic. Um, it's quite similar to this one I think which is some young people don't want to stop self-harming um, and they should have a right to choose um, and I guess that's quite a regular theme of discussions is that if that young person isn't at a stage where they are ready to make a decision, we, we can't be pushing them into anything that is um, that, that is you know is not in their mindset at that stage. Um, but I suppose there is also a um, we have an opportunity when we're working with young people that we need to try and take advantage of to actually um, try and engage with them to explore what the possible risk factors might be of some of their behaviours um, and to look at what the possible benefits might be again of them of them making changes um, and if we can appropriately involve other people in that as well whether that's their parents carers other um, uh, friends maybe or, or school staff so that young people get a package of support around so even if they're not ready at that particular time 
when they are ready and when they feel they've got the right motivation, they can access support in a, in a more, um, probably in a, in a manner that's likely to be a bit more successful. Okay. If a young person can't explain why they're self-harming, there's not a lot we can do to help them. So we um, spoke today about how Mind, the Mind and Body programme uses a lot of um, cognitive behavioural approaches and one of the resources that you guys use is the um, Hot Cross Bond tool. So I think that's a really good tool to help young people think about their thoughts, feelings and how that translates into, into behaviour. Um, just because somebody can't explain why they're self-harming, um, it may just be you need to break it down a bit, maybe they haven't got kind of the literacy to be able to, emotional literacy to be able to explain why it is they're reacting in, in such a way. So I think there's a lot we can do to help them. Um, a lot of kind of psychoeducational work as well around understanding what self-harming behaviour is and um, why people self-harm. Mm. I think that's something that comes out a lot from, from the work is just if young people are helped to understand why they do what they do, it can be a really powerful thing because mm -hmm. generally I think their experience might be that they're told off quite a lot and even they don't know their motivation sometimes mm -hmm. of what they're doing. So yeah, I think that's really important. And a really valuable role, I think, for parents and carers to be able to support that process of helping that individual to understand where they're coming from. And the more they understand that, the stronger that relationship mm. and support can be. I've got reducing access to means is an important means of reducing risk and harm. Um, so I think, again, it's about recognising that actually sometimes by removing um, different th sort of items that somebody might use to self-harm um, actually doesn't necessarily reduce the risk and harm. It can actually increase it. Um, to a certain degree, so we have to be mindful of the reasons why that young person may be self-harming and to actually look at the, the right support around that and then looking at alternative means that they can use and until those are, are in place and functioning well then we need to be mindful of, of not necessarily trying to remove some of those things. Um, but there may be situations where it's really important to look at that, so again, recognising each individual situation is really important. Um, and also recognising that the WHO sort of um, advise of sort of removing um, implements and items that might be used for within that um, but again we have to be mindful of, of recognising the, the possible consequences to that and sometimes that, that self-harming behaviour can be the, the, the difference between um, reducing thoughts or feelings of feelings of suicide and actually by removing implements then actually that can increase that sort of suicidal um, sort of thoughts and, and, and perhaps intention as well. Mm. And I think with that one that was one of the core ones that I guess where we were talking about making sure that the young person is involved in those decisions so to explain that this is the rationale behind it but what we don't want to do is leave them without any um, mechanism that they can maybe keep themselves on that equilibrium so to so that it's not a process where you do those things without their involvement. But if a young person's self-harm is superficial, controlled and their wounds are well managed there is no urgency for them to stop um, and I think the important thing with this one is um, if we're working with a young person, they may perceive that their behaviours are um, not a great risk. However, the, I think the important thing for us to focus on with them is looking at um, why they are taking part in certain behaviours, um, looking at um, what they're gaining from it, and then we can explore with them alterna alternative, safer strategies to help them manage those emotions um, and um, sort of safer behaviours over time and work with them to set an action plan. Okay. Right, so, uh, my last one, um, if a child has been harm free for six months and they slip up, it's back to square one. Um, I think we would be very much against that sort of being the case. I mean, for some young people it will be that they, um, they might take a big step back in terms of their recovery, but actually for a lot of people, um, a slip up can just be, um, uh, a bit of a blip and they uh, on the cycle of change they wouldn't have to retrace their steps and go right back to the beginning again. Um, certainly with young people I've worked with previously actually having a, a slip up can be a, a real motivator not to go back to where they were. They can, um, it can be a bit of a moment of realisation actually they've done it once but they really didn't want to do it again after that. Um, so again I think what we would want to try and do is look at what the trigger was for maybe that change, um, again reviewing things like their motivation and where they want to be uh, and, and give them an opportunity to sort of reflect on, on how to try and stop those things from happening again and 
what um, what can be put in place to support. This is a quite a controversial one. Risk-taking behaviour isn't something we should be overly worried about. So I think the pure nature of adolescence is that young people take risks, but there's obviously kind of um, healthy risk-taking behaviour and, and risk behaviour that can be detrimental to well-being. So, um, I mean, just the young people's love for things like um, places like amusement parks and like fairground rides and stuff when you get a bit older you're a bit like oh I'm going on that it looks a bit rickety but young people are all about taking risks so we on the one hand we want them to go out and kind of um experiment with risk but on the other hand we in the roles that we we take in our work we are quite mindful of of harmful risk behavior um and i think it's really good to have conversations amongst um ourselves within kind of team meetings, supervision sessions, peer supervision to kind of speak about risk and, and mm. where we feel mm. it's kind of harmful. I think we all have different thresholds for different risks. Mm. I think it, again it's it's where it's really helpful for young people themselves to realise that they're they're basically designed to be risk takers. Um, once they know that I think um, it, it helps them sort of maybe manage some of those risks in a little bit. Um, uh, with some of the, the, the right strategies, but it just helps explain why they are <laughs> so important. I, I think sometimes we have to be mediators, so I should imagine, Tom, you're often sat with parents and they're really kind of um, anxious about the risk and the young person's minimalising it. And mm. I think sometimes we, we can um, use our experience to kind of mediate between the middle and say, actually, mum's got a point when you go on top of tall buildings late at night that is risky and something dreadful could happen to you so it's kind of like yeah having to mediate yeah. and I think it was also about again looking at it from different perspectives from parents and carers to, to young people and helping um, both parties to actually understand the differences from where, where each are coming from and having that conversation because I think we look at all of these subjects it's all about the way that we communicate with each other um, and for young people that are, are struggling with around sort of self-harm it's about how they how they actually communicate that information and it's for parents and carers I think it's about that that process of of understanding where their child is coming from and having a clear idea and the best way to do that is have those conversations and that that can be the really kind of key starting point. Mm. I think um, one thing that I've taken away from today um, around risk behaviours and sort of more general behaviours um, when we were discussing what behaviours would be sort of a red flag for us um, I find it really useful to think about it in the sense of um, could a young person go a day without taking part in that behaviour and also are certain behaviours um, like eating behaviours, um, over exercise and things like that, is it ruling a young person's life, is it the young person in control of that behaviour or is it that behaviour controlling the young person when we're assessing um, should it be a red flag as such and um, should we be concerned about it. I think that's quite useful. Mm. If we want a young person to stop self-harming, we should always, I guess there's lots of things that we can do, and, and the, the, the kind of most important thing, I guess, key thing is to involve them in the process, um, letting them be part of that sort of a process, um, and letting them feel in control of that as well, because it's about them being able to sort of make those changes and sustain those changes. Um, by, by the support and again it's about looking at different alternative methods that they can use um, and also again the support around them so recognising the wider family, um, friends, relatives that they've got there that they can actually be there to be supportive um, and to, to be encouraging them in the right way. And then my final one very much follows on from that as well is um, if we want a young person to stop self-harming what shouldn't we do? Um, so the flip side to everything you just said really, um, that if we want to support a young person and we want them to feel um, comfortable in disclosing and opening up to us then um, we shouldn't be judgmental, we shouldn't be imposing um, our own emotions onto them um, and it's important really um, for them to feel like you said that like they've got control and a say in um, the action plan for themselves. Yeah, anyone else, any big no's and don't do? Uh, I think maybe the only thing when we were having group discussion was about um, being mindful of uh, the work that we do being in groups 
of not mm. having conversations which are too open, which might be triggering in terms of specific behaviours for other young people. Um, I think it's really, obviously it's, it's key that we can have very open discussions with young people, but that would be more in a one-to-one -one environment rather than having those discussions where, um, yeah, where it could be problematic for others in that, uh, in that group. Um, but yeah, it, it goes back to, I think, to Tom's point, which everybody was in agreement that it, it, the young person and their, their choices need to be central to that sort of, um, to that process.